I'm Andy Hoffman, Professor of Sustainable Enterprise at the University of Michigan. I have joint appointments at the Business School and the School of Natural Resources and Environment. And I'm also the Director of the Herb Institute for Global Sustainable Enterprise, which is also a joint program between the Business School and the School of Natural Resources and Environment. The talk I gave uh, at the University of Sydney was about the social debate over climate change and trying to look at the cultural and cognitive reasons why people accept or reject uh, the scientific consensus that exists on this issue. What I find in my work is that the public debate over climate change is not about CO2, it's not about climate models, it's about worldviews, beliefs, and values that some people feel are confirmed by climate change and other feel are threatened by the issue of climate change. Do we want to have more government intrusion in the market? Do we uh, trust scientists? Do we trust environmentalists? Do we trust democratic politicians? Uh, these are the issues that people are using to try and figure out whether they accept or reject the science of climate change. So the thrust of my talk is trying to bring in that cultural and value-based element of the debate and use that to look at the science as well and understand that we have to talk about both when we talk about climate change in the public sphere if we're going to ever work through this thorny issue. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you to the University of Sydney for inviting me to speak. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a slightly different lens on the climate change issue. Uh, typically, this issue is approached from the sciences, the hard sciences, the physical sciences, on defining the problem. And one narrow branch of the social science is economics, neoclassical economics, in defining the solution, a price for carbon. Um, both of those are overly rationalistic, quantitative. Uh, they don't get into the human aspects of why may people, people may accept or reject both their statement of the, the problem and the statement of the solution, and that's what I want to get into today. My talk is going to have a somewhat U.S.-centric focus to it. I live in the United States. A lot of my work has focused on the United States, so there may be elements that um, fit in the Australian context. I'm willing to bet a lot of the elements fit in the Australian context. Some of them may not, so we can bring that up in the, in the Q&A of what is different between the U.S. and Australia when we look at the public debate, the political debate over this, this what has become an extremely controversial issue in the United States, getting caught up in what we need to describe as the culture wars. Um, in, the, in, the, in the spirit of the theme that you're supposed to tell people what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them, then that's what I'm going to do here tonight. So I'm going to start with a story. I'm going to tell you the main gist of my argument, and I'll close with a story to try and drive the point home. Um, the beginning, the story of why I got into this area, it, it happened in the spring of 2010. Uh, the University of Michigan has a development office that's designed to get donors to give them money, and it's not uncommon for them to call me and say, would you meet with this potential donor? They're interested in your particular topic area, and we're going to see if we can reel in a, a gift to the university. My particular topic area is business and environmental issues. I hold a joint appointment in the two schools. I run an institute where students get, in three years, an MBA and a master's in science from the School of Natural Resources and Environment. So my area is around sustainability and business and sustainability. And so I agreed to meet with this donor. And we met at 7 o'clock in the morning. That was the only time I had free. And I showed up in the room. And I'm still sipping my cup of coffee, still waking up from uh, the fog of sleep. And I sit down, and the donor is across from me, the development officers are to my side, and the donor begins the conversation by saying, I just want you to know I think the scientific review process is corrupt. And that's the way he started the conversation. I said, what do you think of a university based on that system? He said, I think that university is corrupt as well. And the conversation continued. He went through his reasons why he thought that the science, uh, the, the, the science of climate change was a hoax. We talked about sunspots and solar flares, different aspects of that. We exhausted that topic when he had turned his attention on me and asked me, now, why do you hate capitalism and why do you want to destroy the market system by teaching environmental issues in a business school? So we kicked that around for a little while. And then, um, <laughs> and then he said, now, do you know why Earth Day is on the day it's on? And I nervously said, no. And he said, because that's Karl Marx's birthday. <laughs> um, at that point, I turned to the development officer and I said, what's our agenda here this morning? And he jumped in, the donor jumped in, and said, I want to buy you a ticket to the Heartland Conference. And the Heartland Conference is the number one climate skeptics co conference in the world, and it was taking place in Chicago. And I politely declined. I did have a conflict. And we ended our meeting, and I left pretty angry. And um, uh, I will add parenthetically that Earth Day is not on Karl Marx's birthday, but it, it, is, it is on Lenin's birthday. Um, <laughs> he had... 
he had his communists mixed up. And that is something that is trotted out often, that Earth Day was a communist plot because it coincided with Lenin's birthday. I went through the day and I was pretty angry. I felt that there was a bait and switch. I didn't know where this guy was coming from. But the more I talked to my colleagues and the more I thought about it, the more I actually started to become fascinated. This gentleman had a very coherent worldview. The pieces did fit together on how he viewed me, how he viewed climate change, how he viewed the university and the scientific process. It was a coherent worldview. And interestingly, he had come to the University of Michigan to evangelize me. He came to buy me a ticket to teach me the error of my ways on climate change, and that was his objective. And then I started to see this as a cultural issue. And that's where I started to get fascinated, saying, I want to study this. I want to understand where he's coming from, where I'm coming from, why these worldviews are so different, and how they influence our way of thinking about issues like climate change. And so I'm going to give you the, 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 the main point of my talk today. You can grab this and go to sleep if you like. Um, but the main point of my talk today is that the public debate over climate change in the United States, I'm willing to bet in Australia, is really a debate over values. It's not about CO2. It's not about climate models. It's about values. It's about beliefs. It's about worldviews and how those influence the scientific data that comes forward. Um, and I think that what I'm telling you today can be applied to issues as wide-ranging as nanotech, GMOs, nuclear power, autism and vaccines. We live in a very complex scientific world. And I'm willing to bet that most of us don't read the scientific journals to develop opinions on these very complex issues. We decide on these issues based on our worldviews, our biases, our values, and whether a position on those scientific issues either confirms or disconfirms the worldviews we hold. And that makes this a very thorny issue. Because if someone connects it to their personal identity, then they will hold on to it with great tenacity. And if you present people with more data, they will dig their heels in even harder because you're missing the thrust of the debate. And so that is the takeaway I want you to take. And uh, now I'll go through the main part of my talk, and then I will drive that point home again with a final, a final story. Let's start with some divergent trends to set up the story I want to tell you today. One, we have a scientific community working on this issue. And the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has been coming out with successive reports with a consensus statement that the climate is changing and humans are causing it. And here's the statement from the 2007 report. Another report will come out shortly in September. And the IPCC, uh, formed by the UN, a group of about 2,000 scientists who scan all the, the science out there, all the literature, this is their consensus statement. That statement is endorsed by over 91 scientific agencies around the world, including the scientific agencies of every one of the G8 plus five countries. If you look at surveys of practicing climate scientists, the numbers that believe that humans are changing the global climate are pretty compelling, from 84 upwards of 97%. And this is important. This is practicing climate scientists. This isn't, for example, the Wall Street Journal ran an editorial last year where they said, here is a group of 16 scientists who say that climate change is not happening and that the consensus doc document is wrong. And that included a marketing professor from Wharton the research director for, director for Exxon Mobil, and a host of others. I'm talking about practicing climate scientists here who say that this is happening. So much so that the two most important scientific groups in the United States, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the US National Academy of Science, which was created by Abraham Lincoln to inform the US government on issues of scientific complexity, both of them use the word consensus. There is a scientific consensus on climate change. There's trend number one. Trend number two is in the public sphere. And it's quite interesting. Between 2008 and 2009, belief among the American public that climate change is real declined from 71 to 57 percent. And we just looked up the numbers for Australia right now. In Australia, 77 percent believe that the climate is changing. 40 percent believe that it's human caused. So there is tension in Australian society as well. Now, there's data point number one. Data point number two, which I find quite fascinating, is that 
Belief that most scientists think that global warming is happening declined from 47 to 39% between 2008 and 2011. So not only do Americans in decreasing numbers believe that climate change is real, they actually don't believe the scientists think it's real as well, which I find quite fascinating. Uh, I will say that the numbers on belief in climate change in the United States have increased over the last two years. Uh, it's up around 65% now. But these are interesting divergent trends. And they highlight for me, and what I want to highlight for you, is the difference between a scientific consensus and a social consensus. A scientific consensus takes place in the journals through peer review using data and models and analysis, scientific rigor. A social consensus is a fundamentally different process. It involves a wider range of constituents using a different set of analysis methods that aren't necessarily scientific in nature. They are driven by emotionality, they are driven by values, they are driven by political partisanship. All these are part of the debate. And the people who are part of the debate range from politicians to business people to religious leaders to sports figures. They're all part of the process. Scientists hold the definitive word in the formation of a scientific consensus. They do not hold the definitive word in the formation of a social consensus. And I find that really fascinating when we think about the climate change issue we are in a social consensus or scientific consensus stage. We haven't developed a social consensus. Think about the issue of cigarettes and cancer. For decades, scientists said that cigarettes cause cancer, and for decades, the American public said that uh, did did not agree with that statement. So much so that it was supported by the values of the day. I was able to find these kinds of advertisements, and those of you who are young may find this quite amusing. Those who are older may remember this. But you have ads that say that most doctors smoke camels more than any other cigarette. Or nine out of 10 doctors recommend cool cigarettes. It was actually believed that cigarettes were okay. They're actually maybe even good for you. That was part of the cultural norms of the day. Today, we do have a social consensus uh, that cigarettes cause cancer. And we know this because if someone starts to smoke, someone may sanction them and say, do you know what you're doing? Do you know what you're doing to your health? Why are you smoking? Um, uh, uh, and so we know there's a social consensus on something when we teach it to others as the correct way to think about the world around us. Today we have a, a social consensus on cigarettes. What will it take to get a social consensus on climate change? That's our question that we're facing right now. When we think about climate change as a cultural issue, it starts to take on a very different form than scientists present. And it takes on a form that resonates with how people interpret the issue. And that takes a very interesting dimension to it. First of all, number one, culturally, climate change is not a pollution issue. Uh, despite what the US Supreme Court has said that the US EPA can regulate CO2 under the Clean Air Act amendments as a pollutant, in people's minds, CO2 is not like SOx, NOx, particulates. It's not a pollutant. I am exhaling CO2 right now. Plants outside are inhaling it. Uh, we associate increased CO2 with economic growth. We like an increase in emissions of CO2 because it corresponds with an improving standard of living in our society. So to call it a pollutant just does not resonate in people's minds when they think about CO2. It is problematic on a cultural level. If it's not a pollution issue, what is it? It is an existential challenge to our worldviews. Now let me let you swallow that for a second and get at what I'm trying to say here. Think about the central question around anthropogenic global warming, climate change. Do you believe that our population, our species has grown to such numbers and our technology to such power that we can alter the global climate? That is a huge cultural question. It really changes our sense of the moral order of our relation in nature. It brings in the notion of the Anthropocene that we are now living an epoch where humans are part of the global environment. We do influence it. That is very hard to grasp as a society and we're still grappling with it. That is the magnitude of the issue before us. If you answer yes to that question, think about some of the other questions that fall in line. We need a new sense of global ethics. If you answered yes to that question, then my mowing my lawn in Ann Arbor, Michigan has import for poor people in low-lying areas of Bangladesh. Do you think we as a society are prepared to understand and accept and embrace that kind of ethic? That's the challenge before us. We are not. 
it is a massive, a massive challenge for us as a species. Let's go further. How do we deal with this? Well, we deal with it with some kind of global governance to regulate CO2, an intrusive government program that you guys are grappling with right now in form of the carbon tax in this country. We do this on a global scale. Who will do that? Well, maybe it's the UN. I don't know about in Australia, but in the United States, I have just said something extremely provocative about the idea of the UN becoming this global government that will intrude upon national sovereignty in the United States. That does not go down well in the American public. Now you can start to get a sense of the emotionality of this issue and some of the resonance it has. And then go even further. For some people, to answer that question yes, challenges the notion of God and divine providence. God is in charge out there. We're not in charge out there. It's extreme hubris to think that we are actually altering the global climate. God is doing it. And now you start to get into some real core values that people have and why they may resist this issue of climate change. So that starts to make this fun as a cultural question to study, but it also makes it challenging as a cultural question to solve. Let's think about it more. As we look in the American public, the issue of climate change has taken on a decidedly partisan form. And you can see on the left-hand side there some work done by Aaron McCright and Riley Dunlap looking at public opinion data in the United States over the last 10 years. And what you can see is it tracks along party lines. Over the last 10 years, increasing number of Democrats and increasing number of liberals think that climate change is real, and de decreasing number of conservatives and de decreasing number of Republicans believe it's real. And interestingly, if you factor into these numbers people's self-professed understanding of the science, the numbers actually become more exaggerated. That if you think you understand the science of climate change and you are a liberal or a Democrat, you're even more inclined to believe it's real. And if you understand the science and you're a conservative or Republican, you're even more inclined to believe it's not, which is actually quite fascinating to really illustrate the, the extent to which our worldviews influence our perception and filters on how we were world, view the world around us. On the bottom right is some work that came out of the University of Michigan and the Brookings Institution. It's the most recent data I've seen. And you can see at the very top, 78% of Democrats say that climate change is real compared to only 47% of Republicans. That partisan divide still exists. That, to me, is the smoking gun that this is a cultural issue. Because I don't think you can tell me that uh, Republicans and, and Democrats have different levels of science education in K through 12 or their undergraduate careers, but their political bias gets them to see the science in a very different way. As a cultural issue, a great deal of research is starting to form on this, and I want to pull out four bullet points for you that's in the literature. Number one, there are multiple studies that show that when you look at demographic variables and correlate that with belief on climate change, the most compelling, the most statistically significant is political party affiliation. Um, there are other variables in there. Um, belief in environmental issues in general, it's women more than men. It's educated more than not. It's urban more than rural. It's the coast more than the middle. But political party affiliation on climate change is the most, um, the most uh, telling variable to understand where people's positions lie on this. Critical to the formation of worldviews and, and positioning is people will look around in their reference groups. When they're facing complex scientific information, they look around at who do they trust. They will look for knowledgeable members or sources that they think um, are holding the values that they hold dear. And so uh, I can use two names right now. I don't know if it's going to resonate in Australia, but you're all familiar with Rush Limbaugh? Okay, we have Rush Limbaugh, we have Al Gore. Those names, no matter what the population, one of those names got someone's na stomach to twist. Um, one of those names got people to think, I don't believe a word that person says, or I don't believe a word that person says. Um, both names are polarizing figures, and yet both names are trusted within their cultural communities, within the referent groups. Also, the information sources we go to. Uh, we have Fox News, and uh, John Krosnick at Sta Stanford has done studies to show that increasing viewership of Fox News correlates with decreasing belief in climate change. Uh, he hasn't done the correlate study, but I'm willing to bet that increasing listenership of national public radio correlates with increasing belief in climate change. Where we get our information, the sources we trust, influence how we take positions on particular issues. Even to the point, there's some interesting work coming out that algorithms on the web 
will start to influence the information we get. And that there are algorithms out there that will try and learn your search behavior and feed you information based on past searches. So if you continually look on the web for web pages that say that climate change is a hoax, you'll be more inclined to be fed web pages that confirm that opinion. Um, there's a dating site in the United States, Match.com, that already advertises this algorithm that you can go in and say, this is what I'm looking for in a partner, and they say our algorithm will know you better than you know yourself because we're going to watch your search patterns and we're going to feed you more partners based on what you look at. The algorithms are getting there, and it sort of turns on its head the quip that um, most people, everyone's entitled to their own opinion but not their own facts. The web is actually starting to change that dimension. Now. The final bullet point is critically important. Once people's minds are made up, and once they connect that position to their personal identity, their cultural identity, their connection to the reference group that they identify with, handing them more data gets them to resist even more. Because in effect, you're saying to someone, you don't believe in climate change? Here's some more data. You still don't get it? Here's some more. Are you stupid? Here's some more. <laughs> and the resistance starts to build and starts to break down. If you fail to recognize the deeper cultural elements of this conversation, you're going to find yourself talking to a wall. You're talking to someone who's not going to hear you. So as a cultural issue, these are the ways to think about it. These are the ways to go forward. So if people are shutting down, if they are using their values, their beliefs, their worldviews to accept or reject, and because we're all part of this, you know, my positions on climate change are influenced by my worldviews. I don't necessarily go to all the scientific journals. What do people hear? What is the conversation about? And so I've done some work, a number of others. Mike Hume uh, has a really nice book, Why We Disagree About Climate Change. Start look at when people hear climate change, what do they hear? What are the values invoked? What are the hot button issues? And so uh, one study I did, um, I actually, my doctoral student uh, volunteered, uh, bless her heart, to actually take up my donor's invitation and go to the Heartland Conference. <laughs> and um, he escorted her around. She was very careful not to divulge her position. And she listened to the presentations. She interviewed people. She looked at the literature. And what she was trying to grab were what were the key frames that people used to describe their thinking on climate change. And she found three. And I'll walk through them, and then I'll show you a few more that do represent what the climate change is all about in the public sphere. Number one, a serious distrust of the political ideology of climate proponents. Number one is environmentalists. They distrust environmentalists. And so you can see this first line, that's a quote from the Heartland Conference. AGW believers, that's anthropogenic global warming believers, they hate people, they hate the Western economy. The argument is, and the, and the fear is, that environmentalists are left-leaning, they are socialist, borderline on communist, and they're using the government to try and control your freedom. Who are they to tell us that I can't have an SUV or a 5,000 square foot McMansion? They are not freedom-loving people like me, and they are distrusted. Um, and there's a, a nice book by Naomi Oreskes and, and, and um, uh, um, uh, Kevin Conway, uh, Merchants of Doubt, that talks about this. So that was number one, serious distrust of the climate proponents. And they were environmentalists. Um, the expression for environmentalists is watermelons. They're green on the outside. They're red on the inside. And that really represents their feeling about what they're all about. Uh, they also distrust democratic politicians. They distrust, distrust liberal politicians as pushing their own agenda and forcing it on others. Number two was an unabiding trust in the market, that the market will solve all problems and don't get in the way of the government or don't get in the way of the market. Uh, and there's a, a serious discomfort with the idea of government stepping in and quote unquote picking winners and losers and a serious derision for green jobs, green tech, green anything. Green is for them a code word for liberal government tampering in the market. And then number three, and um, most people find this quite surprising, is distrust of science, scientists, and the scientific process. And this is not new. Uh, uh, there was an author, Hofstedler, who wrote a book uh, that won the Pulitzer Prize in 1964. It was called Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. And what he found was that there is a significant portion of the American population, and I'm willing to bet the Australian population as well, that view scientists with distrust. They sit in their ivory tower. They use a language you don't understand. They do work that we can't comprehend. And they have a, a, a disproportionate influence on the political process. That is scary for a lot of people. Going further, they're seen as cultural vigilantes. 
their conclusions come out and they change people's lives and not always in a way that people like it. And they use data and rational thinking and where is values, where is God, where is beauty? And they really distrust scientists and scientific process. I was actually able to say this, I was at a, a meeting in the US National Academies of Sciences, you can picture this huge um, uh, lecture hall, thousands of scientists and we were talking about the climate change debate and I was able to bring this topic up by saying I was talking to Jim Ball, who's an evangelical minister in the United States, trying to get evangelicals to pay attention to the issue. And he said, Andy, the problem with climate change is there's three primary spokesmen have no credibility with the evangelical community. Number one is environmentalists. Number two is democratic politicians. Number three is scientists. And you could hear people in the room going, excuse me? What was that all about? But that is part of this debate. And so when scientists come forward, people will shut down just automatically not only because they're scientists, but also because the academy is seen as an extreme left-leaning institution. And that's not just a perception, that is a reality. There are surveys that show, at least in the United States, that Democrats outnumber Republicans, liberals outnumber conservatives, four to one in law schools, 18 to one in history departments, and then everything in between. And so the fear and distrust of the academy is there, and it is founded on some reasonable uh, perceptions or, or realities in the, uh, in the academic community. So those are three frames that are engaged when people are talking about the climate change issue. Some others, differing conceptions of risk. For some people, the environmental and health risks are too great not to do something. For other people, the economic risks are too great to do something. And hence, we have a differing conception of whether we should take action or not based on people's different risk perceptions. And risk is a very personal thing. Some people smoke. Some people ride a motorcycle without a helmet. Some people don't. They think those are unnecessary risks. So people have different conceptions of what kind of risk they'll tolerate in which kind of risk categories. There's also differing value or relationship to the environment. Does the environment have inherent value? That is a very interesting question. Ask it in your own head. Do you think the environment has inherent value that it should be protected for its own sake? Some people say, yeah, absolutely. Some people say absolutely not, that nature is there for us to use. And the way this, this uh, I like to explain this one, uh, in the United States, we had a, a really um, uh, divisive debate uh, uh, in the early 1900s um, over the damming of the Hetch Hetchy Valley. And if, if you have been to, any of you have been to Yosemite Valley in Yosemite National Park, if you look at it, it's a, it's a thing of beauty. It's also a hydrologic engineer's dream because you've got these steep walls, you've got this deep valley, you've got this narrow opening. You fill that opening with concrete and you've got a wonderful reservoir at very low cost. Well, just north of Yosemite is the Hetch Hetchy Valley, which was a valley just as beautiful as Yosemite. And San Francisco had just suffered a major fire. And the mayor of San Francisco said, the number one priority I have is gonna be a stable water supply. And he looked to the east and there was Hetch Hetchy. And a debate, a national debate in the United States formed with Teddy Roosevelt in the middle on one side, John Muir, on the other side, Gifford Pinchot. John Muir, uh, the founder of the Sierra Club, the grandfather of the environmental movement, said you cannot do this. This is a sacrilege. Uh, this is a sacred place created by God. And he actually used the analogy, damn Hetch Hetchy, I might as well go to Rome and damn St. Peter's as a cistern for water. It's the exact same thing. On the other side is Gifford Pinchot, the first secretary of the interior who said, this is nonsense. This makes no sense to me. It's the greatest good for the greatest number. We need water. There it is. Let's use it. Now, Teddy Roosevelt sided with Gifford Pinchot, and they did damn the Hetch Hetchy, but that, that, that debate plays out still. Should we protect Anwar, the Alaskan National Wildlife Refuge? There's oil there. Should we drill it, or should we protect it for a bunch of caribou? I'm guaranteeing that most people will never go to Anwar, but a lot of people feel very strongly we should leave it alone. They see inherent value in nature. Others people say, no way. We need the oil, let's get it. So differing conceptions are value of the relationship to nature. Number six, discomfort with the scenarios of climate outcomes. A lot of climate uh, proponents go immediately to the most extreme story of what's gonna happen. Namely, like the movie The Day After Tomorrow, next year Manhattan's gonna be underwater and glaciers are gonna be floating down Madison Avenue. And a lot of people hear this story and they just shut down. They say, nonsense, I'm not with you. I don't believe it. Even the more reasonable scenarios of what climate change can do, a lot of people just start to shut down. A lot of people have a just world theory. They, were, they do believe that the world is a, is a nice place. 
I do believe the sun will rise tomorrow. I believe we'll have a nice dinner. I believe on Saturday I will get on my plane. I will fly back to Ann Arbor. The world is a nice place. And what you're telling them is actually no, that there's uncertainty out there and the world is actually unpredictable and is, can actually do some nasty things. A lot of people just can't go there. They don't, they, don't, they don't believe it. They don't follow it. Number seven is what is the proper role of government? This is a raging debate in the United States. Get government out of my life. Back it off. Small government. But if you're going to deal with climate change, it does involve some kind of an intrusive government program. And if we're going to go to the international scale, we're talking about a, a, a global governance system that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, you can start to see the hot button issues. And then finally, number eight, differing values and notions of morality, and particularly around religious morality. And I find this a tremendously fascinating debate. Uh, for a lot of people, I've, I actually got heckled once uh, in Ann Arbor, where the gentleman started his tirade saying, read Genesis, read Revelations. Climate change can't be happening. God put nature here for us to use. It's in the Genesis mandate. It's here for our benefit. We are using it. God promised Noah he would not flood the earth again. The idea of rising sea levels, it's inconsistent with my religious beliefs. Other people are saying no, it's consistent with the Genesis mandate and the reinterpretation of the idea of being a steward. Uh, there's a very famous paper from 1967 by Lynn White in Science Magazine where he traced the roots of our ecological crisis, which he called it at that time, to misinterpretations of the Genesis mandate in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Now that's a really tricky area we're starting to delve into and I am not a theologian and no one will take me seriously as a theologian. All I'm pointing out is the form of the debate and how it starts to play out. And there are a number of people in religious communities that are very uncomfortable with this direction of the conversation. They see this green theology as deifying nature, as putting nature above man in the moral order and they start to resist. So you can get a sense of these eight elements I've put up here and there are more of what this debate is really all about in the public sphere, and it gives you a sense of the real challenge before us, because you thought you were dealing with someone who just needed to be convinced with um, um, a, a greater statistical significance in their regression analysis, or greater um, uh, compelling evidence in the climate data, when actually this is what you're talking about. Now, I could stop here, as many talks on climate change do, and totally depress you, and say, okay, we're doomed, there it is. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. I want to try and move forward and say, and what do we do about this? And this is where the, the, the research and negotiations and dispute resolution have something to offer. There's a lot of research on how do you broker deals in extremely controversial, provocative, value-based negotiations. How do you broker a deal between the Palestinians and the Israelis? On the one side, you've got the Israelis who say, God gave us this land. How do you negotiate with someone over giving up a piece of land that God gave them? How do you do that? The negotiations literature have a lot to say about this. And so what I want to do is walk through what some of this literature says about how to move forward and then close with the story I promised you. So if this is about values and beliefs and worldviews, I see three possible paths forward. Number one is the optimistic path. The optimistic path is that we don't have to change our beliefs and values at all. We can solve this issue through some killer technology that allows us to continue our lifestyles, continue our belief systems unchanged. That's the optimistic viewpoint. If we develop cold fusion tomorrow, fusion in glass, energy too cheap to meter, which they promised with nuclear power, you will see people start to say, yeah, climate change is real because it's easy to adapt to it, because it doesn't require any kind of change in how we see the world around us. That is where we're aiming right now, both with renewable energy, hybrid cars, compact fluorescence, Technology is going to solve the problem. And it starts to get really interesting when you start to think about geoengineering as another way to say, don't change your lifestyles. We're just going to geoengineer the earth so we continue to live and think the way we do. Technology is going to solve it. So there's the optimistic path, and that's kind of what we're banking on right now. The pessimistic path is that we don't change our values at all. In fact, we fight to support them, and we break down into what I call a logic schism, a fancy word. Uh, Roger Pielka describes the most extreme form of this pessimistic path as abortion politics. In the United States, abortion is an extremely controversial debate. The two sides are talking about two completely different issues. One side is talking about life, the other side is talking about choice. No one looks for information unless it confirms their opinion and disconfirms the other. They even go so far as to demonize, even hurt, even kill each other. Is climate change moving towards something akin to abortion politics? Some people think it's there. Other people think it's not. 
That is the pessimistic path. That's the dangerous path. The third path, and I don't know why that says number one, it should be number three, is to have a full-scale conversation and debate that brings in all the elements. It's not just about science, but it recognizes the value elements to it, the emotionality of it, and brings it all to four to say, can we develop some kind of a common shared worldview going forward that allows us to accept that climate change is real, do something about it in a way that we can adjust our values and find some, some commonality in a, in, a, in a common future. So again, the negotiations literature offers some tactics, um, some, some ways to do this, and let me walk through them. Number one is know your audience. If you find yourself engaged in a debate over this, think carefully about who you're talking to and how they're approaching it. There's a really nice study that came out of Yale University. It's called the Six America Study. And it's a segmentation analysis of the American public. And what they did is they broke the American public into six different categories. Their varying beliefs from totally dismissive to totally alarmed and everything in between. And then they put numbers with it and they started to look at what does that demographic look like. If you graph their study, it looks something like that stylized picture up there. It's a distribution. It's a skewed distribution. There are more people on the side that are convinced that it's real uh, than are skeptical. But I want to pull your attention to the, the tales. And I've called them both believers. One side totally believes that this is real and we're about to face a major calamity. And the other side is a, is a believer in the idea that this is a hoax and this is all just fake. Those two tales are in the logic schism. They're not interested in a conversation. They're not interested in a discussion. They're interested in winning. So if you find yourself with a believer on either side of the tale, my suggestion is talk about football, talk about something else. <laughs> Um, because they're really not interested in the conversation. And I want to be equal opportunity about this. You can have climate believers. They can be extreme in their positions. Uh, David King at Oxford University has a book on climate change called The Hot Topic. And what I particularly like about the book, he, he has two appendices in the back. And one is, this is what climate skeptics are saying, and he, he's refuting those points. This is why they're wrong. But then the second appendix says, and this is what climate extremists are saying. And this is why they're wrong. And he calls it climate porn. Because he says it's extreme, it's titillating, it's meant to excite, and it's false. And so we can think about both extremes of the debate. They're really not in it for a conversation. If you find yourself more towards the middle, now you can start to have a conversation. So don't destroy your Christmas or Easter or Thanksgiving uh, dinner by talking uh, to someone at the table who's a believer on one side of it and is not really interested in a reasoned conversation. Number two, ask the right scientific questions. Uh, a lot of pollsters will lump this all into one question. Do you believe that anthropogenic global warming is happening? And people who study the science tear their hair out because it, it says no, it's more nuanced than that. And there are a series of questions that you can actually start to ask. Some of them fall into the area of strong scientific consensus. Some of them fall into the area of scientific judgment. And there are room for conversation. The first three are in the area of scientific consensus. Do you believe that CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere? The data is quite compelling that it is. You can argue that the hockey stick is wrong. You're really flying in the face of mountains of very compelling scientific data. Does this lead to a general warming of the planet? Again, the science around the greenhouse effect is, is, is very strong. It's very clear. The mechanisms and processes are very compelling. And then number three, has the climate changed over the past century? Again, scientific measurements from ice cores to direct temperature measurements show that the global mean temperature is going up. You can refute one through three. You're really flying in the face of mountains of scientific data. Four through six are a little different, and they get a little more interesting. Are humans partially responsible for this increase? Now, scientists can't show causality. They can't show that we are directly causing it, but they sh can show correlation. And through fingerprint analysis, through multiple plausible hypotheses from increasing solar activity to a number of others, through fingerprint analysis, scientists have decided that the most plausible hypothesis is humans are causing it. If someone says humans aren't causing it, then you have to ask, give me an alternative hypothesis. Because right now there isn't one that's compelling. Humans are the most compelling scientific hypothesis out there for what's causing this. Will the climate continue to change over the next century? Well, if past is prologue and the mechanisms we've described are true, this will continue. And then six, what will be the environmental and social impact of such change? Scientists are not sure about this. We can draw a bell curve where you can have minor impacts on the left-hand side, major impacts on the middle, or on the right-hand side, 
and varying probabilities to go along with that. And you can ask someone, why have you immediately gone to one of the tails? Why have you gone towards one of the lower probability outcomes of this? But in the end, it is a conversation. Scientists are still trying to figure out what do these models tell us. They're still also trying to perfect the models to get a clearer answer of what that means. Once you're done with the science, recognize the emotionality of this issue. Recognize that people are, are looking at this and you're really challenging people to alter their worldviews and their belief systems, move beyond the data and the models. So to do that, number four, try and focus on broker frames. Are there ways to frame this issue that is more palatable among more constituencies? So for example, in the United States, there's a conversation that climate change is an issue of economic competitiveness. Thomas Friedman is pushing this idea that if the United States or Australia does not develop the next generation of technologies in solar, in wind, in battery storage, in geothermal, in smart grid, in demand management, in, um, in national grids, then we're gonna buy the technology from somebody else. So investing in efforts to usher in the next generation of technology is merely an issue of protecting our economic competitiveness. Another frame that's used is national security. If the effects of climate change continue to happen, then that can destabilize political regimes around the world. It require more military intervention. It will even threaten our borders. Uh, there's a group of retired army generals. They describe climate change as a threat multiplier. It will make certain regions of the world less stable and require more intervention from the military. Um, Jay Gulledge at the Pew Center focuses on let's move away from probabilities and uncertainties. Let's frame this entirely around risk. People know how to understand low probability, high consequence events. Uh, any of you own a house, I'm sure you have fire insurance on that house. The odds of your house burning down are low. The consequences are high. I can't absorb that hit if my, my house burns down. So what do I do? I buy insurance. On climate change, someone may say, you know, the effects are gonna be low. And you say, well, what if you're wrong? Can we absorb that hit? And you say the answer is no. We take out insurance. What does insurance look like on climate change? Investment in technology and behavior change. So there are multiple broker frames out there. There was a nice study that was just done by Ed Maybach uh, at George Mason University, looking at multiple frames to say which ones resonate most with the most number of people. His answer was the health frame. Because the key to getting people to care about this issue is you have to make it personal and salient. People respond to what they have an emotional response to. That's why polar bears sell and snail darters don't. Charismatic megafauna, people really feel this warm and fuzzy towards it. They make it personal. On climate change, how do you make that personal? Health, human health, or the health of future generations, or the health of our children and our grandchildren, there's a broker frame to try and push through. And you can see this in action. I am um, back in Ann Arbor, I have a, a, a vintage pickup truck, it's a 1952, and it has the original vacuum tube radio in it. And it only gets AM radio stations. And I've learned that AM radio is the haven for conservative talk shows. And I was listening one day, and the host said, you know, I don't believe in any of that climate change crap, but we gotta get off foreign oil. So we both have the same objective, let's do it. And it's like, there's a broker frame in action. Now, broker frames are challenging because they have, they have potholes in them. Because someone can say, let's get off foreign oil. Great idea, let's do it, let's focus on climate change. And their answer would be, let's drill oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And let's start opening up national parks to drilling. You say, well, wait, time out, that's not what I meant. And so when you start to find broker frames, think carefully about where you're going. Number five, recognize the power of language. And this is very important. Even the words global warming and climate change can elicit a different response depending on the population you're talking to. And there are numerous studies to show that global warming in a conservative population is more inciting. It gets people more upset than the words climate change, which is seen a little more benign. And what I have on the right here is um, a, a study I did. I, I had um, a data set of editorials over a two-year period on climate change, and we sorted them. It was about 800 editorials in the United States. And we sorted them by those that say the climate change is real and those that say it's not. And this was just a simple coding analysis. So what are the words they used? And the upper one is uh, editorials that say the climate change is not true. And the bottom, climate change is true. And you can see on the bottom, climate change and global warming, they carry equal weight. And in, in, in liberal and democratic populations, the words are interchangeable. But on the upper one, look at global warming is huge. And climate change, a little to the left of it, is very small. And pundits, editorialists would use global warming in, in order to incite their audience. I would go further, look at who they talk about. 
Um, the ones that say the climate change is not true talk about Al Gore. The ones that say this was back in the Bush administration. The ones that say it is true talk about George W. Bush. And I assure you, in both communities, they're not saying nice things about these people. Um, <laughs> Al Gore turns out to be the people, the, the person that the, the conservative right loves to hate. He's become a polarizing figure in this debate, and I'll get to that in a second. Also look at the words at the top, alarmist, cultist. The, the AGW believers are following uh, Al Gore, their prophet, to, and Al Gore is just doing this to make himself rich. There's a lot of the arguments above. Down, down below, it's about technology. It's about renewable energy. It's about jobs. It's about green. The language is very different, and you have to recognize that. You also have to recognize that certain words transfer and certain words don't. So in the science, we talk about uncertainty. In the general public, they hear uncertainty. They hear, well, science, they don't know. They're uncertain. When in the scientific community, it's variance around a mean. So you've got to be careful words you use. Even to the point where if you go up to Alberta and you start talking about the development of the bitumen deposits to create oil that will flow through the Keystone Pipeline, I'm deliberately using, avoiding the words. If you use the word tar sands, you have just signaled to whoever you're talking to that you're against it. If you use the word oil sands, you've just signaled that you're for it. Words matter. You can talk about green, green jobs, green tech, someone will start to shut down. Even the word sustainability, I think, has become a cultural value-laden smoke signal that people hear and they start to shut down. So recognize the power of language when you're talking to someone. Even the word denier, climate denier, many people find extremely offensive. They find it as a veiled reference to Holocaust denier and they find it a pejorative. And you'll use that term and you're gonna suddenly find your audience starting to shut down. Employ climate brokers. The messenger is as important as the message. So as you start to make your case, you can say, Al Gore is my prophet, and I believe what he said, and you're gonna have someone just say, yep, it's been nice talking to you, I'm leaving now. You really need to invoke or get people to speak to communities that trust them. So if you're gonna get evangelicals to believe that climate change is real, they need to hear it from an evangelical. And that's what Richard Sizek is trying to do, that's what Jim Ball is trying to do. If you wanna get Republicans to believe it, they have to hear it from a Republican. And that's what Bob Inglis is trying to do. That's what John Warner is trying to do it. If you want to get religious in other communities to hear it, it's important that the Pope just said it in his inauguration mass, that we have to protect creation, we have to protect the environment. Um, and that is where people need to hear it. So we need to hear it from the business community. We need to hear it from politicians on all stripes. Most importantly, we need to hear it in everyday conversation because people trust you as much as they trust the higher level people. They need to hear it in the local town hall, the local bridge club, the local Kiwanis club. That's where the conversation has to come in and you can see it starting to play out. In fact, I'm in a golf league in Ann Arbor. It's just a knock around beer drinking league. And most of the guys don't talk about what they do. They're plumbers, electricians, and I'm this freak that's a college professor, which they find quite fascinating. And then one day, I was in the league for four years before someone finally asked me, Andy, what do you do? And we're lacing up our golf shoes and. And I says, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a professor. And well, what do you teach? Well, I teach business environmental issues. He goes, you mean that, like that climate change stuff? You don't believe that, do you? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, well, actually, the science is quite compelling. And his next question was, are you a Democrat or a Republican? <laughs> so I, I said, well, I'm, I'm an independent. And his next question was, what do you think of Al Gore? That is the form of the conversation. I said, well, I think Al Gore is a polarizing figure. And he started to listen to me. He's trying to establish if he trusts me. And in so much of the social debate today, people are not looking at your ideas. They're trying to figure out whether they should listen to your ideas in the first place. They're looking at your motives. That's what, are you part of my group? Are you part of my tribe? Are you part of my reference group? That's what they're trying to figure out. And therefore, they're not going to listen to me if they see me as part of a group they're not a part of. And, uh, and that's what you need to think about here. Recognize that people are part of multiple referent groups. So someone may come forward and say, you know what, I think the scientific review process is corrupt. And then heaven forbid, if they get sick, they're gonna go to a hospital. And what's that hospital based on? It's based on the very same review process that they say is corrupt. You can start to use this, you have to be very careful because what you're, you're pointing out is hypocrisy. You're pointing out dissonance and people will resist that. People do not like to think they're hypocrites. They like to be consonant. They like to be consistent in their worldviews and their beliefs. But you can use this track. 
And then finally use events as leverage for change. Events can change people's minds. They become periods of discontinuity of how we understand the world around us. And I told you that belief in climate change is increasing in the United States over the last two years. The second part of that story is the survey is they ask what informs your beliefs on climate change? And I've put it in red or in the blue box down below. It's the weather. People are changing their belief on climate change in the United States because of the weather. Now this is tricky. Weather is not climate. They're two different things. Weather is a single event over a short period of time. Climate is a long-term trend uh, of, of, of global scale. And so when you start to do this, when you start to use events as a leverage for change, you have to shift the conversation really fast. Okay, yeah, Sandy, climate change. Climate change is a longer term trend. That one event is not climate change. That one storm is not climate change, it's weather. And they're two very different things. But there are numerous studies to show that people are more inclined to believe that climate change is real if they've extreme, experienced extreme weather. Because now it starts to shake that belief that the environment out there is stable and nice and doing good things, that actually the environment can actually be an inhospitable place that is unpredictable and getting more unpredictable. So those are some tactics for communicating climate science, and, and you can try those at home with friends and relatives. Um, <coughs> I, as I said, I'm going to close with an illustrative postscript to talk about or illustrate the point that this is a debate over values and beliefs. And, and, and here we go. So I, when I first got started in this area, I wrote a paper in Organizational Dynamics, a fairly obscure academic journal for sociologists. And it was my foray into sort of laying some of the groundwork from my work on the idea that this is a cultural issue. And I laid out the literature on culture, connected it to climate change, and then I had two throwaway paragraphs in there. One was an analogy to cigarettes and human health. And I pointed out, as I did earlier, that there's a scientific consensus on, on cigarettes. For a while, there wasn't a social consensus. Now there is a social consensus. I made another point, too, that's worth pointing out. A lot of people are saying, when science gives us the smoking gun on climate change, then I think it's time to act. And first of all, science never does that. It can't say conclusively A causes B. It can give you correlations. It can give you models and data. Um, but it can never say conclusively. And you do not need that smoking gun for a social consensus to form. The connection between cigarettes and cancer is something we actually still can't prove. The US Surgeon General's report that said that cigarettes cause cancer says epidemiologically we can show you how it can happen. Statistically we can show you how it will probably happen. But quote unquote, in the end, it's a matter of judgment. Climate change will always be in that area of in the end, it's a matter of judgment. To do a perfect experiment, we need a control. We need another planet Earth. I don't see one coming up anytime soon. So the idea of a perfect experiment to see if this is real or not, it's not going to happen. And the system is much too complex, just as the human body is much too complex. I could do an experiment right now. I could ask you to all start smoking. Some of you get sick. Some of you won't. Um, it is not a definitive cause and effect. And climate change is the same. And I said it, it requires a shift in our worldviews and our beliefs. And I said, how big a shift? And this is where I got into um, interesting territory. I said, as big as the abolition of slavery. Now, analogies are tricky things because you can say what you're trying to say and then people hear something very different. So the analogy I was making is this. If you go back to the 1700s, 17th century and 1700s, three quarters of the world's population was in slavery or serfdom. It was the number one source of power. And the economy of the British Isles depended on slavery in order to work. Now, I'm talking about the abolition of slavery in England, not in the United States, in England. And in England, it was a very effective social movement that used various techniques that we take for granted today, such as petitions and boycotts. But when abolitionists stood on the street corners of London and said, we have to abolish slavery, people said, you're out of your mind. You're going to ruin our quality of life. Our entire economy is based on it. And now people are saying, we have to abolish fossil fuels. And people are saying, you're out of your mind. You're going to ruin our quality of life. Our entire economy is based on it, and that's a fact. In the days of slavery, people supported it with the values of the day. The, there's slavery in the Bible. Slavery is part of the natural order. And a debate forms so whether that's right or not. Today, do you think that we can get to a point where people may have some kind of a moral overture towards climate change or greenhouse gas emissions as we have towards slavery? I'll bet you can't, and that's my point. That's how big a cultural shift we're facing. We can't even envision it. And that's how big it is. So I wrote that paper, <clears throat> and it came out to 
a big yawn in the academic community. <laughs> but the New York Times picked it up, and they wrote a story on it. And then the Scientific American picked it up, and Time Magazine picked it up, and I'm feeling pretty heady. I'm like, public intellectual. People are reading my work. It's in the, it's in the, in, in the world out there. And then a colleague emailed me and said, Andy, I see Mark Morano is taking his hits at you. <clears throat> and I said, excuse me, who's Mark Morano and what are you talking about? And I will preface this by saying, luckily I was on sabbatical at Oxford when this was happening, so I wasn't easily found. And, um, <clears throat> and he said, uh, Mark Morano used to work for Rush Limbaugh, and he used to work for James Inhofe, who famously said on the floor of the US Senate that climate change is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated in the American public. And he has a web page called climatedepot.com. I actually strongly recommend you go take a look at it. And so I went, <clears throat> and this is what I found. On the bottom right, you can see my picture. On the bottom left, you can see Adolf Hitler's picture. <laughs> and in the middle is the entire coverage of the article. Professor Andy Hoffman says that climate skeptics are the moral equivalent of those who defended slavery. And then there's my email address. And there's where the fun <laughs> begins. So before I get to that fun, I will show you <laughs> my secretary track hits to my web page. And that spike on the right is the New York Times article. The smaller spike further to the right is the Climate Depot web page. And it's important to point out that if you want the copy of the article, you can go to Organizational Dynamics, and I hope there ever is in the room, and you have to pay 30 bucks for it. And I, quite frankly, wouldn't pay 30 bucks for it myself. But if you go to my web page, you can get it for free. And look at the scale on the left. 110 people went to the source article. The rest relied entirely on the New York Times and climatedepot.com. Yeah, I had become part of the culture wars. No one cared about what I said. It was just, am I evidence to confirm someone's position and disconfirm somebody else's? I had stepped in it. And I didn't realize it. And this is what happened. The emails start pouring in. I actually keep a folder of climate skeptic hate mail. And <laughs> I'm a social scientist. I, I am in a business school, but I am a social scientist. I'm trained in, in, in applied sociology. And as a social scientist, I look at that and say, there's data, and what do I do with it? Well, I code it. <laughs> and what you find <clears throat> are the very values that I talked about in my talk. Suspicion of science and scientific elites. You know, I'm a criminal. Are you stupid? Don't you realize that CO2 is plant food? It's not a pollutant. My days of milking the system with my phony science are numbered. You self-appointed overseers expect us peasants to take you and your fellow scientists seriously. That says it all right there. I don't trust you. You're a scientist. I don't trust you. It goes further. Suspicion of my political ideology. I'm doing the work of Satan. Um, I must be a secular evolutionist, which I found quite interesting. I must not believe in God if I believe in climate change, which is an assumption that goes straight to it. Um, I'm a green terrorist. Um, why do I want to do eco-imperialism? I'm a racist. Um, greetings, comrade. Why do you want Marxist destruction of civilization? And then fear of economic disaster. Why do you want to store, lower the standard of living of people? And why do you want to de-develop the world? Now, I do this with some jest, and I don't mean to do that. Because I think one of the most important first steps in engaging this debate is not to blame or mock or ridicule. In a functioning democracy, everyone's worldview needs to be heard, and a debate has to happen. And a lot of people hear climate change, and they hear judgment. And they hear people saying, you are bad. Your lifestyle is bad. And they get resistant to that. And so all I'm trying to say here, here, to make the point in my talk, and then I'll stop, is why would someone send emails like this to someone they don't know? It's not about CO2 and it's not about climate models, it's because some deeply held values that they hold dear are under threat, and then they want to defend them. And if we don't recognize that dimension of the debate, this debate will not be resolved. Thank you very much.